Before the events of the Resident Evil games, Jill Valentine served in the United States Army. While in the Army, she gained the attention of the nation's primary counterterrorism unit, Delta Force. Despite this elite unit's policy on not enlisting women, Jill was allowed to take part in the six-month operator training course. During her time in the course, Jill excelled in bomb disposal, lock picking. Here's a lock pick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. And more, as she became one of the only women in the world to complete Delta Force training. Impressed by Jill's impressive array of skills, Albert Wesker recruited her into the Special Tactics and Rescue Service Unit of the RPD after she left the military. She soon became the only woman to join Wesker's Alpha Team as the Breaking and Entering Specialist. Following the Mansion incident, Jill, along with the surviving STARS members, confronted Chief Irons about pursuing an active investigation into the Umbrella Corporation, but were denied. You gotta do everything yourself. In order to bring down Umbrella, the STARS unit would need to do it themselves. In late August of 1998, an eager Chris Redfield traveled to Europe to begin the investigation. Barry Burton would relocate his family to a safe place in Canada before heading to Europe himself, while Jill and Brad Vickers stayed behind in Raccoon City to reduce suspicion and investigate Umbrella activities stateside. The unfortunate combination of zombie dogs and a T-virus contaminated water supply cut the investigation short, leaving Brad and Jill trapped in the infected city of Raccoon. Pursued by the ultimate killing machine, Jill and her friends must make one last escape. It's in your blood. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. The nightmare continues, only from Capcom. Welcome to the Resident Evil 3 entry in our ongoing enemy lore series. In an effort to reduce redundancy in these videos, we will be omitting the zombie, zombie dog, the crow, spiders, and the liquor, as we've already covered them in detail. In their place, here is some concept art for a cut zombie horse enemy that would have been twice the size of a human. Look at him! Squishing this little guy. So hit the lights and let's dive into the world of survival horror once again. Good luck. First up, we have the Drain Deimos. Named after the Greek personification of fear and dread, the Drain Deimos is a flea that has been exposed to the T virus after feeding on a zombie. Originally asexual creatures that reproduce through parthenogenesis, their mutation has allowed for another method of reproduction. With their newly mutated ovipositor, they thrust a massive amount of larvae down their opponent's throat. The cure to being forcefully impregnated by a drain deimos is to eat a green herb which will expel the unwanted larvae. If there are no herbs available, the parasitoids gestate in the victim's stomach and it is only a matter of time before they violently burst out like a xenomorph. These hematophagous insects will suck all kinds of fluid from their prey, ranging from blood to bone marrow, but are most interested in human cerebrospinal fluid. Extracting this fluid with extreme prejudice, the brain and nervous system are left in tatters. Due to these brain cravings, the Drain Deimos is often mistaken for the Brain Sucker. The difference between Brain Suckers and the Drain Deimos begin during infection. A Drain Deimos starts mutation after feeding on a zombie. A Brain Sucker is exposed to the T-Virus through feeding on non-zombie BOWs. This subtle difference makes the Brain Sucker slightly stronger, mutate a second head, and develop the ability to spit poison. So it's best to take these guys from a distance. Rather than feeding on the cerebrospinal fluid of its victims like its cousins, brain suckers will smash the skull of their prey and, of course, devour the brain of its victim with their long tongues. Next up, we have the terrifying Grave Digger. It's an arthropod that was accidentally exposed to the T virus through contaminated soil. This contaminated soil is the result of the umbrella incineration disposal plant P 12A not properly disposing of their failed test subjects. Grave diggers have mutated to grow 10 meters in length, gain four massive mandibles, and develop the strength to break through concrete and asphalt. The grave digger reproduces by laying hundreds of eggs that hatch within hours into sliding worms. Sliding worms are about one meter in length and feed on the blood of their prey. 
These worms often travel in packs and when they latch onto a host, their white colored body gains a reddish hue from the blood of its victim. It only takes about one week for a sliding worm to molt into a fully grown grave digger. Like zombies, paleheads are the result of humans being infected with the Epsilon strain of the T-Virus. For those who haven't watched our other videos, the E strain is what causes zombies to mutate into a crimson head or liquor. The pale head is yet another branch of E strain mutation. Pale heads have developed a fibrous white mass of skin that can regenerate, just like another sort of mutant BOW. Okay, Bob, let's try that again. After witnessing the regenerative capabilities of the pale head, Nest 2 shipping and processing manager Gabrielle Reed urged Umbrella to manufacture weapons capable of destroying a palehead in the event of an outbreak. As Raccoon City fell, Nest 2 lacked the proper weaponry and the facility was massacred by paleheads. Despite their apparent lack of eyes, paleheads have no trouble locating their prey. In an attempt to reproduce this mutation, Chief Brian Irons was tasked by Umbrella to abduct human test subjects. However, due to the Raccoon City outbreak, the exact origin of the Palehead mutation was never determined, therefore it was considered an unviable bioweapon. Up next we have two variations on the Hunter, Beta and Gamma. We'll start with the Hunter Beta. After William Birkin's success in producing the Hunter Alpha, Umbrella cheaply cloned it to add more genetic modifications, which had mixed results. Betas are covered in tumors, which can block the BOW's eyesight. Despite this handicap, the betas still pose a threat. They have an enhanced nervous system that drastically increases their speed and agility, allowing them to dodge gunfire. The trade-off for this upgraded agility led to a decrease in the betas' attack power. Just before the outbreak in Raccoon City, Umbrella was in the process of planning the final tests on the beta so they could decide whether to mass produce them or not. When Raccoon fell, Umbrella took advantage of the chaos to send in the betas to monitor and test their performance in a live environment. Member the failed lurker BOW from RE0? Hey, you shut the fuck up! Yeah, we're gonna kill you, maybe! Where are you? Nicknamed Frogger, the Hunter Gammas are the result of a reinvestigation into the potential for amphibious BOWs, where Birkin's Hunter Alpha was created by using the T-Virus to bond reptilian DNA to a fertilized human embryo. The Gammas replaced the embryos with fertilized amphibian eggs and bonded them to human DNA instead. The result is a BOW with no teeth or eyes, small T-Rex claws on webbed hands, and a large mouth capable of swallowing its prey whole. Despite the Gamma's heightened intelligence compared to the dumb lurker, Gamma's were considered a failure. This was due to them exposing their vulnerable mandibles just before an attack, some not developing claws on their arms, and the inability to survive in open air or heat for long periods of time. When Umbrella ordered all Gamma's to be incinerated, an Umbrella researcher that had grown attached to them snuck a batch down into the sewers as the moist environment would be suitable for their survival. Post-Raccoon City, Javier Hidalgo used the experimental limitations of the Gamma to his advantage, dispatching them in tropical environments seen during Operation Javier during the Darkside Chronicles. Next we have the Nemesis Alpha Parasite. These parasites can be found on the heads of zombies or paleheads put there by Nemesis himself. When transplanted onto a host, it attaches itself to the spinal cord and absorbs the internal T-virus cells to grow. It will then form a unique brain near the medulla oblongata as it invades the central nervous system and destroys the host's frontal lobe, modifying the neural network to link to its own brain. They act similarly to the Plagas from later entries, taking full control of the host body. They have sharp claws and a long tentacle they use to swipe at their prey. When they grab someone, they'll fully enclose their victim's head with their sucker, ditching their current host for a new one. Before moving on to our titular title villain, Stars. we have to mention Nikolai Zinoviev. While never actually mutating into a BOW, he is still a major antagonist during the fall of Raccoon City. 
Codenamed Silverwolf, Nikolai served in the Soviet Army and was subsequently recruited to the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service when the Soviet Union fell. Rising to the rank of sergeant within Umbrella's paramilitary group, Nikolai soon became rivals with the Grim Reaper himself, Honk. On September 15, 1998, the UBCS was put on alert by Umbrella HQ about the deteriorating situation in Raccoon City. Just two months after the mansion incident, several patients at the Spencer Memorial Hospital were being treated for T-virus-related symptoms. Eleven days later, the outbreak had reached critical mass and the UBCS was sent in to eradicate the zombies and evacuate any surviving civilians. For low-ranking members like our friend Carlos, these were their only orders. But for Nikolai, he was tasked with assessing the effectiveness of the bioweaponry against the capabilities of the UBCS, destroy any evidence and research of the developed T-virus vaccine from Spencer Memorial Hospital, obtain combat data on Nemesis T-type, and to capture or kill Dr. Greg Mueller to obtain his Thanatos project. Mueller was an umbrella researcher that went rogue and developed his own tyrant model known as Thanatos. Impressive. I won't underestimate it next time. But you'll need to wait for our episode on Resident Evil Outbreak for more on Thanatos. Umbrella appealed to Nikolai's vice of greed by offering monetary rewards for each objective that he successfully completed in the streets of Raccoon. Nikolai's greed knew no bounds as he sought double his monetary gain by sharing his data with a competing pharmaceutical company. Nikolai would only successfully complete one of his objectives by killing Dr. Nathaniel Bard and destroying the vaccine research. There are differing accounts on what befell Nikolai during the events of Raccoon City. He was either killed by Nemesis, shot down in his helicopter by Jill, or was left behind by Jill and Carlos on the Nest 2 rooftop. While one account does end with Nikolai escaping and surviving Raccoon's destruction, it is unlikely that he is still alive. Despite these opposing accounts, Umbrella did receive at least a small amount of the data that Nikolai was tasked with recovering. And now, if we could have a drum roll please for the penultimate B.O.W. of Resident Evil 3, Nemesis T-Type. The origin of Nemesis can be traced back to the Tyrant Project we discussed back in RE1. While the American branch of Umbrella researched the Tyrant Project in an effort to create BOWs that did not lose their intelligence, Umbrella Europe developed the Nemesis Project which used parasitic organisms to replace the brain functions in BOWs. Umbrella Europe saw very little success and put the Nemesis Project on hold as Lisa Trevor was one of, if not the only survivor, to bond with the Nemesis Alpha Parasite. Umbrella had new concerns about the reliability of their bioweapons when a small Midwestern police unit had easily dispatched their T-002. As a result, Umbrella decided to reinvestigate the Nemesis project by using the newly cloned T-103s. In one account, when the Nemesis parasite was implanted into a T-103, it gained a sense of self and attempted to escape the facility. This event proves the parasite drastically increased the intelligence of the tyrant and suggests the B.O.W. has the ability to rebel against its creator. When Umbrella got word of the Raccoon City outbreak, they took advantage of the opportunity to monitor their B.O.W.s in a live setting. One such B.O.W. would be the Nemesis T-02. Nicknamed the Pursuer and aided with heavy weaponry, it dropped into Raccoon City with the goal to eliminate all members of STARS. STARS. Despite Umbrella's hope to wipe out all of STARS, only Brad Vickers and Jill Valentine were in the city. Through its rampage, Nemesis was able to take out Brad and infect him with the T-Virus. Jill proved to be a bit more slippery for Nemesis, as she outsmarted the monster many times over the course of his pursuit. Nemesis's power limiter would become damaged as the nights raged on, allowing his mutations to run rampant. In the original game, the first mutation Nemesis incurs is that his tentacles grow larger and stronger, using them to grab his prey and whip them around. The Nemesis Alpha Parasite itself can be seen protruding from his neck in this state. Further damage would lead to Nemesis transforming into a beast-like creature that really likes running in circles. Like 
In his final mutation, Nemesis takes little resemblance to his former self. The Nemesis we've all grown to love over the course of Jill's last escape becomes an amorphous blob capable of spitting acid. The seemingly invincible creature meets his demise when Jill decimates him with an experimental umbrella rail cannon, known as Ferromagnetic Infantry Use Next Generation Railgun, or Finger. And with that, we conclude another entry in our Resident Evil Enemy Lore series. Next up on the docket, we'll be traveling to Rockford Island to explore the enemies found in Code Veronica. As always, thank you for watching.